Um, so my name is, uh, my name is Lucy Byatt and I'm Director of Hospital Field and I've got an absolutely huge presentation so I'm going to just race through it and I know there's going to be a bit of time for questions at the end so they may be too hard but please ask any questions that might come up during, during um, my presentation. So um, a long-lived contemporary art organisation managing and working with our heritage and our history um, and we are an independent trust which brings advantages and fragility. So I think the interesting thing for me after working at CAS with all those museums across the whole of the UK, 64 museums, many of which were run by local authorities, the idea of running a historic place which was independent, a trust that gave all the, um, uh, gave me the freedom to do things was a, a fantastic attractive thing, but of course there's no safety net. Um, and so we have no endowments, we have no funds, so there are, a lot of our time is spent raising money and I'm sure everybody's in a similar boat. So I've broken this um, talk down into six chapters, which I'm going to be very fleeting about, but the first one being, so just thinking about what our assets are, our 19th century assets, thinking about the location, which is incredibly important because we are not central belt and I'm learning how incredibly devastating that can be. Um, <laughs> Responding to the 20th and 21st century, uh, to the legacy of the 20th, 20th century into the 21st century. Um, and then this idea of programming. How do we program? How do we get a really consistent focus on program which is around audiences and how we engage audiences year after year so they have a real understanding of, of, the, of what your program is trying to do. Um, and then how we're working now wider beyond the edges of our, of our property um, and why, and then our capital development. So I'll see if I can race through all those things. I might not be able to. Hospital field. We kind of got this sort of strange name. Although this is a Victorian building, this was a, a medieval site um, where uh, a monastery was built, a hospital, a hostel to support the abbey in, in our growth. So um, that, that this is the, the origin of our name. And sometimes people turn up with broken arms, but generally we're trying, we, 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 are, we embrace our name and, and try and reassociate it away from the National Health Service. Um, and this is this extraordinary facade of the building that an artist called Patrick Allen Fraser developed over, 80, over 60 years of him living. Um, he married the last heiress of the estate and, um, and, he, was, uh, and he, he, he really was, first, it remained, although he was from our growth, he was educated in Europe, um, and, and in Edinburgh, and, but he brought his networks back to our growth when he married Elizabeth. Um, and so all our collections tell of that story, tell of that 19th century story of his commitment to um, particular artist networks. And this is our picture gallery, so that the, the large sort of projected piece of the building, um, probably one of the most important Victorian 19th century um, rooms in Scotland absolutely as it was when Alan Fraser died in 1890. Um, and then, but he was, he wasn't creating his own home. He was creating an institution. He was looking at institutions that were being developed at the time, the V&A in London, the Royal Academy, who was thinking about how you exhibit, how you sh show collections, but also how you teach, how you support younger artists. He was, um, and so these, these are all our, this, this story of Alan Fraser and the buildings that he left behind so on this side, um, is his studio. He left a, a very clear bequest that he, he, he wrote long before he died um, and with the idea that he would leave Hospital Field as a place to support artists. And in the first years when the Trust um, first started, so in 1902, it opened as an art school um, and these enormous studios were built to support the art school. In 1873, his wife died and he built the mausoleum, the mortuary chapel, we call it. Extraordinarily encrusted um, building, beautifully carved, absolutely arts and crafts building. Um, and in the ownership of the council at the moment, which we're, we're negotiating for a, a, a peppercorn lease so that we can look after it because it's not properly open to the public and it's not, it's sort of, it, there, there's an, I think we feel confident that we will look after it and, and be able to raise money. To, to restore it properly. Then really within our assets are all our archives, the collections. Um, we've, my predecessor was a historian who's, who um, had the job um, 
for 37 years, and he had read every single one of these pieces of paper and wrote notes about it, but nothing was digitized, nothing passed on. I'm sure, you know, we all work in these environments, don't we, where, where people have worked there and, and have immense knowledge, but there's no facility to, to move it. So our job must be to make this research ready, research relevant, so that, so that we can invite people in to use it, to, to link it onto, into the world. So where we have William Corder Marshall here, in the picture of William Corder Marshall, he was the first chair of Hospital Field, and one of Alan Fraser's absolute closest friends. But he also carved part of the Albert Memorial, he carved all the statues on the front of the Royal Academy, and so we must, those connections, he was a great Scottish sculptor who lived in London, we must make those connections, because without making those connections, without articulating value, the value and connectivity of our collections to, to the rest of the world, then we are, you know, we, we can't take that um, position in research culture that we should be. Um, we also have letters in the archive from Dickens, because Alan Fraser was chatting to Dickens about the support of writers and so on. And so making the archive available, making it visible, making these conversations um, uh, pr present to our audiences is absolutely essential in the future um, as, we get, as we get this fragile material um, ready, if you like. So I heard a little sort of rumble through the audience when I said this thing about um, working from the periphery. Um, I've never worked in a small town before. I'm completely committed to the idea of the town, the, town, the city I am fed up of hearing about, cities, about their, their future, about all this sort of um, uh, endless discussion about um, future cities, you know. Um, we really need to champion the town, the provinces, the regions, and the struggle to, to, with, among, with funders to, to persuade them that we can be ambitious, that we can do world-class programmes, that we can develop great relationships with our communities and so on. It is, it is an absolute uphill struggle when you see the proportion of investment in the central belt. Um, and I'm sure many of you run or work for organisations that are at the edges that have amazing important histories and how difficult it is to get that investment. And we, we um, I'll talk a little bit, we did, a little, we did an exhibition in the high street of our growth this year, um, uh, a major show that was commissioned by an arts organisation called Art Angel, and we had 2,000 visitors, which is tiny, it's a tiny audience. It then went on to Bristol, it had 45,000 visitors. And of course, Bristol can hit all those targets, but we've got to articulate, if we're working in the peripheries, what the values are that beyond just the visitor numbers. We've got to articulate the, the health and well-being issues, the, the fact that we're, we're working very closely with the audience, that we are in a development stage, far um, earlier stage perhaps than those towns and cities that have for so long had so much investment. So you can hear my resentment. I'm resentful. <laughs> um, so here we are at the periphery, so much so that we're right by the sea here. So we have this absolutely beautiful um, context. Um, the, Caravan site here is as a result of land sales over the years. You can see, you can see this happens to many, many organizations. Uh, Alan Fraser, when he died, one of the biggest land owners, a very successful businessman, at, you know, Polymath. Um, he uh, accumulated a huge estate, and really the organization has, has lived on land sales over the, during the 20th century, which is very, very sad. Um, however, we still have 60 acres, and one can have too much land. So we're, we're now at a point where we're moving forward and we're not going to look to selling any of that asset for, to survive. To me, that would be a great failure. And then we look at these fantastic images of the 20th century, of when the art school of Cowie, James Cowie, amazingly important painter, being at Hospital Field. Um, but what's the name? John Byrne here, the very young man um, at Hospital Field. Um, and so all this is rather a feat idea of the painter, you know, that was the early part of the 20th century, this art school. Um, but now we do things like, you know, now we have a completely different idea of, um, of the way in which we support artists, whether they're um, um, academics, um, perform performance artists, whether they're painters, whatever. We're not really very interested in just thinking about painting as it were in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and we have this very, very strong artist residency programme, which is, which is very much about supporting artists' time. In a, in a, it's not really about community, generating community. 
it's about uh, other than really supporting the artist community if you like this is a very it is not an opportunity this is an opportunity that i think comes out of our bequest and um, we're not we're we're re rethinking the bequest thinking about how we can support artists for the future um but and doing it really well at a national international level and i think that we you could go to many galleries i get text messages from people saying oh here's an artist that that you've just been so yesterday i got a text message from somebody in somerset in a gallery saying because they this artist has put on their cv that they'd have a residency at hospital field so it's this also this fantastic word of mouth mechanism we have about 48 artists over the over the year and we have these very carefully tailored programs um, some funded programs and some where people pay for themselves to come but it's a very subsidized route um oh look i put that i supposed to say rhythm so I think this, this idea of the, the, pro, the rhythm of programming is enormously important. The fact that, um, uh, that we, have, when we, we have the same residency programs every year, we have a children's procession every year that we work with at our schools, we have um, the Sculpture Commission. This is enormously important that, that we become really um, recognised by our audiences. They understand, they come as a ritual to each thing each year, and that we're very committed, that we, we're, we're committed to our programmes and that we're growing our audiences around our programmes. We're not chopping and changing all the time. We're not shifting and deciding, oh, nobody came to that, so we'll change it. I think if nobody comes, but you feel really committed that it's a good thing, then you have to continue it. Um, and we, we know that um, everybody hates contemporary art, See that smiling. You know, we know that people. We know that if we do a bat walk in the grounds, we get forty people coming, which for us is a, for one evening walk around the grounds at night with a bat expert. That's a big audience for us. And that, and when we do our beer and berries festival, we get nine hundred people in the day, and we do that every year, and we're building up the program around it. And, and obviously, because Angus is such a food area, it's very very linked to the place. And perhaps if we do a, a special commission or a special artist project. We, we won't get such an enormous local audience, but we'll get a big audience from Edinburgh and Glasgow and so on, and down from Aberdeen. So we're really very, very careful about the way we think about our programme in relation to the way we're speaking to our audiences. And this is quite a specialist project that we do every year, summer school. People come from all over the country um, and they come for three days and they camp on the grounds and, it, and, and it's very specialist around contemporary practice. Um, we've invited two Dutch artists to develop the programme for next year and they're going to focus around the four foot story of the four four witches so that's actually the first time that we've had um, artists who've been really interested in taking something from the place to, to as a starting point for the summer school um, but really whatever weather we're outside or we're inside or whatever but, 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 but there's there's a real focus on on um, these people speaking with each other making new networks making new connections um, and learning and then our children's procession, which I feel quite proud of because it's been uh, quite a slog because you know, we all work with schools, you know what pressure they're under, especially time-wise. But now they've really adopted this procession every year. It's the end of year procession, which celebrates the, the generation of artists, of, of, sorry, of children going on into their next school, into secondary school. And so it means that we shout out everybody's names, hopefully over 10 years, 20 years, their um, parents will be sending their children to the schools and they'll be having the same. So it's this rhythm over the years of things happening. It's a tradition, introducing new traditions to this place. And actually, Hospital Field is situated on the side of a road which um, connects two, com two communities or doesn't connect, I suppose divides two communities. So Tim Queens and Muirfield, the two primary schools, um, catchment for 600 or so children, um, and they, we spend massive time <coughs> negotiating with the police to close the road down um, because it's, um, it's becoming the bypass around our growth. And it's, it's a really problem with, with, with the, the way in which poor our growth has, has over the years made its planning decisions. But essentially, it's, it, we're struggling to, to well, we, I think we're really committed to trying to make that road porous, if you like, for the, for the community. And one of the me mechanisms of doing it is this, um, is this um, children's profession that we commission an artist every year. So there's just three slides from each of the last three years. 
Um, and this year, um, 2019, we had choreographers who worked with the children. So they, they worked around movement and dance. And of course, in Angus, all the arts, all the art specialisms taken out of primary schools now, there is none left apart from a bit of music. So you know, that, it feels irritating that this poor arts organisation is the only resource for um, culture for those schools, for, for arts in those schools. Nevertheless, we just do it because it's, it's a really important thing to do. Um, and again, we have this project that we do every year where we invite an artist to develop a drawing school, a different artists every year, they have 12 months and they develop it in their own style and, the, and people are coming um, all from young people to all, you know, it's quite interesting to see how our communities are using that as a resource. So we, we need to do quite a big assessment now as we're sort of 18 months into it um, to see who, who is actually um, drawn to, to this thing, this drawing school. But it felt like a really important um, uh, new project to, to uh, appropriate, it fitted very well with the history of Hospital Fields as an art school, this idea that one, one could go and draw. Um, and then and then what we have is an opportunity as a small, as, a, in a, as an organisation within a small town, is that we can bring artists to show all over the world and we can bring to our quite small community and we can show their work, but we can also introduce them. So this is Laura Aldridge answering what looks like a rather difficult question from one of the school. You can see her scratching the back of her head. But she also um, ran this project where she did this pit kiln where we dug out a big pit and then she built this, um, uh, everybody did lots of ceramics and they burned it in this, they, they built the heat up in order to fire it in this pit, pit kiln. So it was a, a huge project over, over several, um, several weeks. Um, and then the way we use the interior of our buildings is really important. So this is um, a sound work, but also with obviously pieces, that, pieces of work that um, affect the architecture. I think we're very good with the way that we use our interiors and our, you know, we're, we're very safe and we keep, you know, um, we're, we're not a, a registered collection, but we are very careful with the way that we um, uh, maintain the interiors of our, our, of our um, building. I heard, I could hear, because I can hear everything that goes on in the corridors, and we have this group of volunteers that come every Friday, and yesterday I heard two talking saying, Gosh, you know, it's very great. It's nice being able to go into these rooms, but they have no security. And I thought, oh, that's great. It's really good in a way because what, what we do is we open all the rooms so that when our volunteers come on Friday morning and work on the archives, that they feel they can have access to the whole building. And as soon as they leave, everything's locked up again. And so they have that sense. I must correct them about the fact that it's insecure. But it's quite nice that they have that sense that the building is open to them because that's the intent, that's our intention. This is an artist, a, a, a collaboration between Susanna Stark and Hussein Murder, who made a, 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 a work using a lot of the skylights in, in the house and the windows. Um, so completely changing the spaces, the interior spaces, by affecting just the, the, the glazing, but also the sound work. So here, if you can see on this rather pixelated slide, there's a boy sitting on the sofa here, and he's in this room all on his own, which is very nice for him listening to the sound work that's in the space. So that's a, that's a kind of nice slide because you could, it's quite interesting that he decided that he was going to sit there and spend time listening to this work. Um, and of course we invest funds into new, new work, into new artwork. And this is a, um, a project by Tamara Henderson, a Canadian artist who we had as part of the residency programme. And she was making a new work for Glasgow International, the, the big art festival. Um, and then it toured, and now uh, much of this show has been bought by Tate, and it's opening at Tate in December as part of the display. And it's, I suppose, you know, the, 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 the equivalent within your world, I'm sure, is about the way in which you speak to your national and international bodies around archaeology, around histor historic um, sites and so on. We, we must be international we must take the make the work of hospital field that can go out into the world and this is an um a nice example of something that that quite by well not by accident really because i've never known an artist work so hard in my life but tomorrow you know she, she this is a, a um a piece that has found its way with a film that she made at hospital field into into a very major collection and that's really really important for, for us 
Um, and but at a very unglamorous environment. So, you know, it's very cold on hospital field. So although she looks as though she's wearing a dressing gown, I think it's a coat. Most people wear a lot of clothes there all the time. And, you know, it's not a glamour. And we, we do have to improve the environment. It is no investment has been made since that 19th century period, really. And we, we absolutely have to update it as an environment. Not only because um, our income is from a little bit of funds from Creative Scotland revenue funding, but, um, but we also make about, you know, we have to make about 70% of our income through hiring, hiring hospital field, thinking really, really creatively about how we make partnerships um, in order for um, us to generate an income. This is a, this is a, a, a work um, by an artist, who I'm going to forget her name, that's terrible. She was quite hard work. <laughs> but she worked hard too, and she made this amazing, she did make, a, so this is another, again another point about work, where you support an artist, um, and, she, um, and, and then that work goes out into the world. So this has been very published, this is actually my dog that she took a great life into, but, she, but this work has been published in masses of art magazines and so on, and that's very good for us, it's very good for us to get that, that to be thinking about that, um, that wider world and how we fit within that wider world and it's very important for the way that we work with communities, the way we work with our local people as well because it is all about pride and this idea of that we can, um, that, that when the people are aware that we're, we're an organisation that's reaching beyond the edges of the, of, of the town, of the region. And that we feel very proud about bringing this work very locally into our growth that would either, either you would see in London or you'd see she lives in Athens, so you'd see all over the, the world. And then this is a, a project that we did with a, an artist called Lubaini Himid, who very shortly after this won the Turn Prize. So, you know, it, it, we, we are quite specialists. You know, we are, as you have your specialisms, we are specialists in the art world and we, we sort of have a, quite a good barometer. <laughs> Maybe I had a better barometer before I started living in our growth. <laughs> um, but we have, an, uh, we have within our team a barometer for artists that are sort of on their way to where, where, where we know that where, we know that what the support we give is going to be really effective and, and um, for them and um, for the way in which they can work beyond the time they spend with us. This is a beautiful mural made by um, um, Francis McGowan. Um, and so it was really fantastic to use the space for meetings and events and so on. We get, and we then paint it out, which is a very sad day, but it's a, a very lovely commission to be able to use one of our spaces, which obviously here hasn't got masses of very important collections in it. And then the event. The event is enormously important in our programme. The way in which we, um, we invite people to not come endlessly for historic tours, but to be thinking of Hospital Field as a place that they might come and see a play, they might come and see a musical performance or an art performance or a, a talk of some kind. We want Hospital Field to be on, on, the, um, on, on the radar in terms of return visitors, always people coming, using us like a, a community space, if you like, or, a, or a, um, a, an event space. They, we want people to come several times a year not just for a like, guided tour, but, but because they're, they're, there's a whole range of interesting programmes happening. Let me skip through this bit. This is Iron Sketch Commission. My pictures, because I've just been given a five minutes warning. <laughs> so, um, this is a guided tour, of which we do many, many of them, and people come, and that's great. And it's within our, one of the things we do within our programme. But the place partnership program is something we, we began at the beginning of last year. We sort of fought quite hard for the funds in, in 2018, Creative Scotland funding. And it, it occurred to me, I had a conversation with somebody from the National Theatre because we were trying to get them to come and do a production in our growth for 2020, the, the um, 700 year since the declaration of our growth. One would think they would be champing it a bit to do a thing like that. However, they said, which, where's the strategy? Where's your cultural strategy? Um, who would be supporting us? And that, you know, on I got a bit irritated with that. But on reflection, I thought, well, they get their money from central government. They've got all their evaluation to do. They need to know that the partners that they, they choose to work with are hitting the sort of same 
criteria that, that they need to hit for, to sustain their funding. And Angus has no, not a whiff of a cultural strategy. It doesn't really know how to run its museums. It's just changed, it's just moved its museum, its, its culture and sport out into a charity. It, and, and hospital, and I, it, I began to realise how absolutely essential it is for hospital field to exist within a strong cultural strategy. That we're, we're not just on our own. Um, that, that, that the Angus Council, that Angus Alive, understand what we're doing and how that's meeting their targets. But if they've got no targets around culture, then we're, we're not we're no, nowhere on their radar. So part of the place partnership, as well as trying to create this festival for 2020, is about tr is, is about putting some of that investment into getting Angus Alive to um, appoint somebody with some knowledge around culture. They have nobody in that team who have any um, uh, to develop to devise a cultural strategy. And I'm not really one. I'm a one for doing things. I'm not really one for bits of paper that get dusty on top of shelves. But I do believe that a, a, a cultural strategy, in the guise of an action plan, in this situation where you're trying to shift a region that really hasn't embraced culture at all, um, within the context of cultural heritage and museum delivery and delivery of, of important um, historic sites. Um, that if we can somehow be a catalyst for a, a roadmap or a plan of some kind, then that, that will serve us in very good stead in the future. And also, um, you know, I do I, I serve a region in very good stead. I, I, I think that just because we are in, in a peripheral region, in a rural region, doesn't mean to say we shouldn't have the most excellent exhibitions, the most excellent collection care, the most in, important um, engagement and education programmes. And, but we're we're so far behind the line. It seems to me that um, that, that 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 we need to be working very closely with the strategy, with the strategic change. So just a few images of the amazing heritage of our growth. Has everybody been to the Arbroath Abbey? Incredible, wonderful place. Beautiful. You know, when we think, about, I mean, I think when you talk, think of our growth, do you think of her hypodermic needles running down the high street? Some people do. There are none. Um, but I think um, it has had a bad reputation. However, it is the most gorgeous place. It is a wonderful, wonderful place with a fantastic it's a high street with a fantastic mercantile history. Um, and we are trying really hard to, to work with the community on their food strategies, their food and drink strategies, um, bringing this exhibition, which is the Andy Holden Natural Selection Project to the high street, to a derelict building in the high street. Um, and really building our volunteer programme and our engagement programme around those kinds of exhibitions. Um, and maybe I'll end there, because although I could tell you all about our building project, I don't know if that's very interesting for you. I think really your interest is around communities. So maybe I'll stop in relation to thinking about how we, how our influence can somehow affect our place. Thank you.